the near miraculous economic rebound of the last two years has pushed down unemployment to historic lows, with poverty rates finally falling in tandem. And these important measures will continue to move in the right direction as we intensify our focus on policies and programs that unlock chances for upward mobility. I am particularly proud to highlight that 2023 will bring more money into the pockets of some 30,000 Belizean workers who are poised to enjoy a minimum wage of $5 per hour at the start of the new year. This $5 per hour is a 50% increase for one in every six of the lowest paid workers in our country. Earned by the employee's work, not gifted by the employer, the individual empowerment conferred by a living wage is a foremost responsibility of the state and the foundation of social justice. Adam Smith, known as the father of capitalism, reminded us in his theory of moral sentiments that the ethical basis of society lies in compassion for other human beings. Reversing the equality gap of recent years is not just a societal interest, but a national imperative. And it is this commitment to compassion that compelled us to allocate earlier this month an additional $4 million for Carl Huchner Memorial Hospital to ensure tertiary health care is improved for those who can least afford private care. Furthermore, 2023 will span access to NHI program to 208,427 Belizeans. In the new year, 59,726 Belizeans will enroll for the first time in a program where doctors and medicines are quickly and affordably available. And in 2023, the accelerated rollout of starter homes, the awards of housing and farmland, and the extension of our free high school program will all represent a scaling up and scaling out of this administration's most impactful social justice priorities. In simple and straightforward terms, you should measure our success by keeping count of every new small business, every new job, every new homeowner, every new farmer, every new graduate, every Belizean better off than before we took office in the win we pledged to deliver. The year we leave behind, 2022, was a turbulent one. A devastating war in Ukraine, skyrocketing prices for fuel, costly supply chain disruptions, 40-year highs for inflation, and economic uncertainty all rendered a post-pandemic recovery more difficult for most countries. Judged within this upheaval, our country's performance is even more exceptional. At the start of 2021, my administration's first year, I encouraged small steps to stabilize the nation and reverse the alarming decline at the hands of the UDP. Those steps rescued the Belizean dollar, transformed the public finances, refocused investments in critical areas, and inspired confidence in the private sector, the IFIs, and foreign investors. At the start of this year, those steps became strides as the economy expanded. Thousands of new jobs emerged. Public sector employees had their salaries restored. Investments poured in, and Belize enjoyed global acclaim for the spectacular commitment to conservation and debt reduction. Our efforts at debt reduction has reduced the national debt by over $1 billion. Our debt to GDP ratio went from 133% under the UDP to 63%, a remarkable accomplishment to say the least. And now, in 2023, these steps and strides will become leaps forward as the twin propellants of tourism and agriculture elevate the quality of life yet higher, even as governance reforms cultivate greater inclusiveness, transparency, and national happiness. To every Belizean, I offer my gratitude for your contribution to the national welfare. 
We are a nation of limitless possibilities, a land where dreams spring forth from a soil rich and resilient, a country whose national fabric is woven from the timeless values of dignity, hard work, fairness, compassion, and mutual respect. And on behalf of our cabinet and the many men and women who are your government, I wish all Belizeans a happy new year. Long live Belize. Que viva Belize. <laughs>
One elderly man was killed while another is recovering in the hospital after they were both shot yesterday evening. It happened in the Albert area of Belize City, and it appears that tour guide Emmert Flowers was killed because the gunmen wanted to get at his son. Courtney Menzies found out that the story is still a little more complicated than that, though. Two senior citizens were sitting inside a yard on Racecourse Street when a gunman ran in and opened fire on them. 77-year-old Dusseldor Waite was rushed to the hospital, while 61-year-old Emmert Flowers died on the spot having been hit several times. But neither men were troublemakers. They were just trying to peacefully enjoy their senior years. But Flowers' family believes he was targeted because of his son's criminal history. My brother don't never get into no kind of trouble. Best brother ever. He don't give no trouble. You know, he get along with everyone and everyone out there last night was telling me they chance him out his debt. You know, he don't have nothing to do with what his child does here. My kids in, um, in L.A., they can't take it. I called one of his daughter a few minutes ago, and she's out of it. They're just crying. They haven't seen their dad from the time he came to Belize. And right now, they tripping off. Of, nobody don't know where's my nephew. Mm -hmm. You know, so I don't know. I just have to prepare to bury my brother. Motuda was just a friendly person. He likes... Um, he likes to do tours. He always talk about tours. He's a, he's a very happy person. He mm -hmm. likes the ladies. He's a ladies man too. You know, he tour. works hard. He works with tour guys. And that, that was his only motive. He always wanted to own his own um, van and do his own tour stuff. He was a, a kind person. He, like I never had see her, saw him never in a conflict with no one or nothing like that. He always want to get with, like with a lady or get comfortable or something like that. Um, all his life since he came back from America, I haven't saw him locked up in the police station, nothing. It's just that the, the things that your child do sometimes, it comes back to you. And right now, Flores' son, Carl Latchman, is missing, and his family fears the worst. My nephew is missing for the last three to four days, and I understand that. He's supposed to got kidnapped, and whoever got him hold, they, I would ask for them to let him go, or I don't know. But they got him hostage, and they turned around and killed my brother that don't have nothing to do with what my nephew do in Belize. And for this family, it's one tragedy after another. Flowers' sister explained that she just wanted to spend the holidays with her loved ones. And now she has to end the year by planning a funeral. Man, it's wicked. I did not come to Belize for this. I come to Belize to enjoy myself with my family that I have here. You know, now I have to prepare to bury my brother. You know, I just lost a sister Sunday on the first could make one year since she passed away and now I have to bury my brother you know and then go back home I don't understand when was the last time you spoke to him I haven't truthfully I did not speak to my brother for a year mm -hmm. so you didn't make up before he died no ma'am but I spoke to him when they put him in the truck and while they continue to grieve this family has a message for the gunmen out there. All I want to say to this camera, to all of the gunmen, please put down the gun, guys. People to get hurt for their family. Innocent people to get hurt, you know. Young people try to change our lives and do different things, you know. Motivate ourselves. We got kids coming up and we want for kids get better, you know. We just have to stop take different people to be a target, you know, and because we got loved ones and we feel hurt when they kill our loved ones, you know? And everybody, this thing just did not that everybody do. I don't just want to the gun, man, put down the gun. Do different thing in your life for 2023. Courtney Menzies, 7 News. Flowers was the father of five. He's been living in Belize for 15 years after leaving the U.S., and he used to run cruise ship tours in his van. And while Emmert Flowers' son is still missing, so is another Belize City man, Akeem Augustine. Yesterday, we spoke to his sister-in-law, Nerisi Mejia, who claims that Augustine, a father of one, went to a party on Christmas Day, but 
never returned home. Since then, his family and friends have conducted searches for him, both on the infamous John Smith Road and in the Jane Usher area where he was last seen. Augustine had been shot to the side of his mouth last year in Hopkins, but escaped that attempt on his life. He has yet to return home, and at this point, his family is starting to fare the worst. Seven News will keep following this story. We'll take a break now. When we come back, we'll tell you about the very special bail arrangement for the British soldier accused of harming and abducting his Belize fiancé. Don't go away.
British soldier Private Perry Stratford wept in court yesterday when he learned he was going to be remanded to prison. He had hoped to get a soft remand at the Batsub base in Ladyville. This is after he was charged with kidnapping, theft, harm, and damage to property in a domestic dispute, which reportedly all started after he confronted his Belizean fiancé with text messages on her phone showing that she had cheated on him. But tonight, he got his wish after an emergency bail hearing in the Supreme Court this afternoon. Our court reporter was there, and Cherise Halsall has this story. 30-year-old Perry Stratford, a British soldier, may have been limping today, but he was certainly relieved to be in the custody of his own army after he got Supreme Court bail. In a first-of-its-kind arrangement worked out by his attorney, he will spend what would have been a remand period instead at the Batsub Army Base in Ladyville. So today, your client a few minutes ago left in the presence of two military personnel. Yes. And that's where he will remain until his case... Until the conclusion of his matter. Yes, until the conclusion of the matter, he will be in the care of Batsub. The learned... Justice was particularly perturbed about the fact that military and law enforcement officers at all costs, so long as they have not been convicted, should have alternative uh, places for them to reside until their bail can be heard at least. And Elrington explains that Stratford has received some very strict bail conditions, including six months of anger management counseling. Understanding the unique circumstances of the matter before us placed some very, very strict conditions on Mr. Stratford in granting him bail. And those conditions include but are not limited to the fact that he cannot leave the, the premises at Christ Barracks. He must report every single day to the military police. Um, and of course, the normal conditions apply that, if, if, that he cannot get into, cannot be accused of any other matter while he is out on bail. And, and obviously, he cannot contact the virtual complainant in this matter. He was also um, ordered to do six months of anger management. Yes, that was one of the additional um, issues, one of the additional orders as well. And while it's a fairly straightforward arrangement, Stratford also had a statement he wanted to make. He says he's the victim. For some days, my client had been expressing the fact that he was, that he too wanted to put on record his version of the events because he felt that he was the victim in all this issue. And so the judge from the bench ordered that they comply with his request and allow him to give a statement. Um, so obviously that the police can investigate and prosecute if necessary. Sherry's Halso, 7 News. Police have now recorded a counter complaint from Stratford made against his ex fiance He denies all allegations made against him. He was detained on Christmas Eve and spent four nights in custody. The bail hearing was held in the courtroom of Justice Ricardo Sandcroft and the prosecution had no objection to bail. Sancroft noted international practice is that no law enforcement officers are to be housed in the general population of any prison. Stratford's next court date is set for February 17, 2023. Earlier this month, BEL made a request for an increase in the mean electricity rates during what is known as the annual review period. Well, the decision arrived to our newsroom an hour ago, and the primary outcome is that in its initial decision, the PUC denied that rate increase request. As part of the initial decision, the PUC notes, quote, BEL has requested that the PUC recognize an additional $14.7 million for excess cost on electricity purchases that the company anticipates it will incur between January and June of 2023. Cumulatively, the amendment submission from BEL estimates that the excess cost of power over the annual tariff period 2021 to 2022 and 2022 to 2023 will be $43.2 million. 
BEL indicates that it is not seeking to recover the excess cost of power, but rather it intends to register the sum of $43.2 million with the PUC as recoverable on their future tariff adjustments, end quote. The initial decision then goes on to say that to offset that under collection under the current rates will amount to those $42.3 million and it would result in an increase by tariffs by a minimum of 4.6%, that's sorry, 4.6 cents per kilowatt hour over the full tariff period. The PUC has perused its figures and justifications and they have since determined that there were errors and omissions. Consequently, the PUC's determination is, quote, BEL's ARP 2022 amendment submission is rejected. BELB is to undertake a more rigorous analysis and consideration to be prepared for and submitted in the upcoming 2023 annual review proceedings and C, Schedule 6 of ARP 2022, final decision remains unchanged for January 1st, 2023 to June 30th, 2024, end quote. Of course, this is an initial decision, so we will seek comments from BEL on its outcome. Turning now to the sugar industry, we told you last night how the millers at the BSI began accepting cane deliveries at their Tower Hill factory. They are trying to make up for the eight days of lost productivity due to the stalemate from last week. At this time, there are multiple challenges. The mill is starting at half capacity as it continues to finish up its air emissions project for its second boiler. Also, the bad weather during the Christmas weekend made it difficult for farmers to prepare their cane for delivery on Tuesday. Well, representatives of BSI tell us that at 11 this morning, they began grinding the cane that has been delivered so far. We are informed that the mill still doesn't have enough cane to operate at its potential right now, but that they've made a start. As viewers will remember, they have made the point that stopping and starting are very costly so they are hoping that there will be no reason to stop due to a lack of steady cane supply the employees are hoping that the farmers can continue to provide them with enough quantities of cane to keep the mill running we'll keep following the latest developments and while the cane crop started a week late and the dispute remains unresolved in his new year's message the prime minister is calling it a success. The nine-minute message sees the PM taking a victory lap on the economy, unemployment rates, and reducing the debt stock. But before that, he took a bow on the sugar industry. Stakeholders in the all-important sugar sector bridge their differences so that we expect a bumper crop in both volume and price. To make this happen, my administration expanded our fuel and road repair subsidies supported improving crop yields as a priority, and in a major first, will facilitate substantial fertilizer support to farmers, thanks to the government of Morocco. And while that particular round of self-congratulation was a little bit wobbly, the PM hit full stride when he spoke about the economy. The name miraculous economic rebound of the last two years has pushed down unemployment to historic lows, with poverty rates finally falling in tandem. And these important measures will continue to move in the right direction as we intensify our focus on policies and programs that unlock chances for upward mobility. Our efforts at debt reduction has reduced the national debt by over $1 billion. Our debt to GDP ratio went from 133% under the UDP to 63%, a remarkable accomplishment to say the least. And now in 2023, these steps and strides will become leaps forward as the twin propellants of tourism and agriculture elevate the quality of life yet higher. I am particularly proud to highlight that 2023 will bring more money into the pockets of some 30,000 Belizean workers who are poised to enjoy a minimum wage of $5 per hour at the start of the new year. 
This $5 per hour is a 50% increase for one in every six of the lowest paid workers in our country. Earned by the employee's work, not gifted by the employer, individual empowerment conferred by a living wage is a foremost responsibility of the state and the foundation of social justice. And while the January 1st increase in the minimum wage is a signal accomplishment of the Bresenio administration, the Chamber of Commerce is still not on side with that move. As we have reported, the $5 minimum wage is being implemented against the advice of the Chamber. They say that the financial strain on the private sector will be significant and that a resulting negative consequence in jobs insecurity for the Belizean laborer who should benefit from this change. And that job insecurity was just one of the many issues our sunup house was raised with Chamber Rep Marcelo Blake when he sat down with us yesterday. Here's a snippet from that conversation. The law prescribes minimum wage, right? And so minimum wage at the $5 is what is within the control, so to speak, of those policymakers. Anything outside of that really is at the... Uh, Employer. will of the employer right. to be able to adjust. So what you were referring to is what we've been saying too. There's a rippling effect that will come. So I'm at 3.30, I moved to $5. I was an unskilled worker at 3.30, but Brandon was at $6 as a semi-skilled worker. So Brandon will say now, but wait, you're only One a, dollar a dollar me. below me yeah. now. So well, shouldn't mine. I be, <laughs> exactly, shouldn't I be looking forward to some adjustment just the same, and that then obviously creates an additional cost. But even the $5, if we take it back to the productive sector, also has an effect. We have just gotten, or well, I should say we will, <laughs> become less, uh, uh, the, what's the word I'm looking for, less viable in the international market because we now have a higher cost of production. Right, well, I mean... Yeah. So we're not as, uh, I guess, uh, in the forefront as we used to be, maybe, with those partners that we used to sell to, because now we no need to go back and recalculate all those numbers to see what our end product will now cost versus what it used to cost. The price of everything will be impacted within the next year, within the next couple of months, because at the end of the day, employers... One of the things that has been overlooked is that employers have still been struggling. There, there are quite a few employers who have still been struggling after COVID to try and get back. We have employees who are still not at their 100% salaries back yeah. mm -hmm. because the employers say, you know what, I really can't afford it, but I really want to hold on to you. You're a good employee. So now with this change, obviously, there's going to be that cost whether I want to increase you or not. I must based on the law, which then means my cost of operation has gone up. So now I need to make the, the hard decision. Several options can play out. I could decide and say, you know what? You need to go home. I, I really can't keep you. Or if we, there were five of you, I will keep three and I'll have to let go too. Let go too. A statement from the government on December 22nd says the increase is part of the government's strategy to quote, combat poverty and reduce inequality. The release adds an increase in income in the hands of consumers will provide a stimulus to the Belizean economy through increased demand and consumption. U.S. Ambassador to Belize, Michelle Kwan, made her first morning show appearance on Sun Upon 7 this morning. She was on to discuss her new role, the special relationship between Belize and the U.S., and the shared values between both countries. But she also chose to speak on gender-based violence and the role we all have to play in ensuring citizen security for all. Here's a look at that conversation. There are shared common values mm -hmm. between our two countries uh, of democracy, of freedom, of fighting for human rights across the board. Uh, and I've had wonderful and very successful meetings thus far. I've only been here three weeks but talking wow. about shared challenges, uh, about citizen security, border security, uh, again, fighting human rights, fighting for human rights, and across the board, working together. 
Well, I think it's important to listen. Listen to the community. Listen to, in gender-based violence and trafficking persons, it's listening to the survivors and to hear their experiences, to tackle the challenges at the heart. I think when you look at our two countries and how we share common values of democracy, of freedom, of human rights, and, and like I said, I've had real successful meetings thus far uh, talking about the importance of education. I mean, when I went to St. Anne's School and see these kids, you know, so light up and to hearing the perspectives of the, their teacher and to listening to what they are learning from mathematics to, to different, it's, it was so eye-opening mm -hmm. and, and striving for economic prosperity. Um, I think across the board, it's, there's so many similarities. So I hope that I can help continue in that path of economic prosperity, of uh, Belize continue to be a champion of democracy and fighting for human rights across the board. And we take a break now and we come back. NIAC shut down Waterloo. Now the Ashcroft Ally Group is going for an appeal. We'll tell you why some are raising concerns. And we'll look back at one of our favorite stories of the year. Don't go away.
Silky Salvation. It's one of our favorite stories of last year. The concerted community effort was made by Placencia villagers to save the fast eroding silky. And back in July, our news team made the trip down south to see the newly resurrected silky, brought up from under the water line using a common sensical community funded and organized event. Here is a look back at that story. Silky is back. The once eroding island looked positively solid against the waves and the sea breeze. So solid that it's crazy to think that South Silk Key owes its very existence to Ewart Garbutt and the group of Placentia residents who refused to let it drift off into the depths. A lot of things that change island where I never do see a road they road. So when I see Silk Key going the way it was, and if we last hope, Mishiris, I think coming out here, you see many islands. 99% of those islands don't owned by me or you. They owned by foreigner. And we invite and welcome foreigner. That's a nice thing. But don't you think we have to own something? This island is more than just tourism too, you know, just to let you know that every birthday, my little girl birthday is the sixth. So we came out for instead of having a birthday party. This stuff we birthday party, this stuff we heritage. Every birthday when they go, the next one over there, my son does enjoy that. When he me young, that that for him birthday spot, that gone. A birthday spot, that history. So uh, we cannot allow for another spot like this because tourism is great. But a lot of we leave, the people when not do it, like think that things are only for tourists. Even the turtle come up and lay egg. That to me, that want, watch it touch every, 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 every part of my heart and soul. But for touch people, and Ewart has managed to touch people from all walks of life with his mission for this key going all the way to cabinet. We thought government assistance. And so I told them that you might not have the money now to restore Silky, but these people are really started. So what I want is your support. And so cabinet agreed and asked me to arrange a meeting with the Minister of the Blue Economy along with Ewart and his team. That meeting was arranged maybe one week after in Belize And we all went there. And the support of support from the Ministry of Blue Economy and the CEO was extremely amazing. And if you ask the crowd, what's amazing is the teamwork and the many small parts that dozens of Placentians played to accomplish Ewart's mission. Placentians like Wendy Lemus. The love I feel for uh, our country, our community, and this island also, you know, benefits everyone. I work in the tourism section, so this actually benefits us. And he was only asking me to help him with some food or whatever I can, I can, you know, to to bring up people and to help. And uh, the day I drop off the food by the uh, marina, I didn't want just to drop the food off. Immediately, I changed my mind and I said, you know what, I want to go with, you know, back racks. Like he said, he likes to tease me about my sexy nails because I actually never think twice, you know, to come and work. I never care about my nails. All I care about was to, to finish the work and bring and save the island. And it wasn't just the adults to save this island. We spoke to two young men who brought out their paddle boards and built the island's new rock walls with their bare hands. I feel like we're a different island, like this summer, lone water, where we made a pond. That we bring back the island from a small, small, little sand pile, I say, into a big island, and now people are getting seat. Still, no major story is without its conflict. And for this small group, that conflict came when the Coast Guard tried to shut them down. The Coast Guard made a come out here, and then I walk here, he were at jail, but then... We all are we may say that all are we may holler to the end that if they care you right now to care all are we. Luckily it didn't come to that. And on Saturday the Minister of Home Affairs, who made the boat trip out to Silk Key, told us that the near arrest was just procedural. Any sort of reclaiming or dredging or filling of any land does require approval in advance. Um, but like I said, this was a purely people initiative. Everybody coming together and say, we will do this. We, we don't need to get our permits because we want to save Silky. And that's wonderful, you know, but there is a process. And I think the Coast Guard that came out that day um, was just to clarify what exactly is happening. There was no huge operation in terms of a dredge coming to dredge material. And so I think they realized that what they were 
they're doing is very sustainable. The way that they're uh, restoring silk queue is a very sustainable way. Um, so of course there are those uh, initial reactions whenever uh, reclaiming is taking place, but I think once that was done, and even cabinet took a decision and said, we have to support this type of people power movement. And in the end, Silk Key is as much heritage as it is a commodity. Placentia's chairman says the island that the villagers rebuilt will continue to sustain the village for a long time to come. Placentia is, is definitely growing as a destination, a lot more visitors, and um, these islands do have carrying capacities. Uh, we have a lot of people out here today, uh, but in the high season, in December, January, um, in April, uh, May, we get a lot of foreign visitors and uh, we definitely need uh, some uh, more spaces that we can accommodate um, all these guests. Cherise Halto, 7 News. Ebert and the team still have their eye on restoring Middle Silk Key, but before they can do that, they'll have to determine whether the island turned sandbar is privately owned. This morning, the lesions on Facebook took notice of a post from a mystery social media account that calls itself Belize Marine Life. The post states that Waterloo, which is the developer behind the port of Belize's cruise port and cargo expansion project, have appealed the refusal of the National Environmental Appraisal Committee. We have since confirmed with Minister Orlando Habet that indeed the developers have filed an appeal. Belize Marine Life makes the case that under this appeal, a three-member tribunal appointed by the ministry responsible for the environment could potentially overturn the refusal that the 14-member NIAC delivered. According to the environmental protection laws currently in place, upon making such an appeal, the minister shall appoint a tribunal to hear and determine all appeals made. A tribunal shall be constituted of a magistrate appointed by the chief magistrate or a judge nominated by the Chief Justice, one member appointed by the Minister and the Senator representing private sector. The Tribunal has the power to confirm, vary, amend or alter a decision made by the Department or reverse a substitute such decision. End quote. That Tribunal can make that decision by a majority, meaning only two members out of the three are needed to carry a successful appeal. So since only two out of the three tribunal members have to support a successful appeal of the PBL Waterloo project, we now return to the views of one of the tribunal's members, the business senator. As viewers will remember, one of their constituents, the Belize Chamber of Commerce and Industry, has made its stance clear on the development proposal. They support it, and that's the point that the Chamber made in their war of press releases against the Department of Environment. They also made that point to our news team two weeks ago when we asked about it. That comment made in the, the release by the Department is on an assumption that, in fact, that technical information provided would have changed our vote. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, we are, in fact, as you rightly said, pro-business, pro-development, and unless it's going to be detrimental to the country, then why would we not support the initiative? At the end of the day, you have to look at each um, investment and each project individually. For us, the port, um, the Belize expansion, the sorry, port cargo of the expansion. cargo expansion is, the cargo is very important to, to commerce and to business, and having that central within the city um, helps for the movement of every um, container that needs to be transported across this country. And so that expansion is very important to uh, business on a whole, particularly to commerce. Within an eight mile, eight square mile radius, you have three competing interests. You said that the chamber is pro-business and I get that, but an integral part of business these days is our ability to strike a balance between that and the environmental concerns. Did the Chamber of Commerce take that into consideration when it said yes to the cargo expansion project? With the information that was available to us, yes, we did take that into consideration because at the end of the day, the environment is important. And of course, with our view that um, business must continue, it can't be to the detriment of the environment. 
that we support something that would uh, have uh, adverse effects at the end of the day. But the larger NIAC seems to think that based on their environmental impact assessments and the, and the, and the series of sa the science in general, seems that it's going to have an adverse effect on the in environment. Well, for us, we can only go based on the information that was available to us, and so we placed our vote using that information. Um, for us, at the end of the day, the environment, while it's important, business has to continue just the same. So it's always going to be a balancing act. And while the other members may have seen something differently, uh, we continue to stand on, on our vote. And this evening, we contacted business Senator Kevin Herrera for an interview, and he told us that he isn't prepared to make any comments at this time because that would preempt the process. But while that appeal process continues to take shape, the Prime Minister has indicated to the press that the Port of Belize cannot continue to stay in receivership indefinitely. Here are those comments from last week. PM, are you aware if investors are coming in to check out Port of Belize and would you be entertaining privatization again rather than nationalization? I don't know how we could get to that. I can't answer that question um, simply because it's not something that, that we're there yet. We have already, we have to wait until the, I think it's the 21st, probably today. Up to today, I think the Port of Belize have, um, or Waterloo, um, time to appeal um, the judgment. Um, and so we want, to, we want to wait and see what will happen. But certainly we cannot keep the status quo at the Port of Belize. An investment has to be done to fix the, if, if there's no cruise terminal, the port or the container slash cargo terminal has to be upgraded. That's not a matter of if it will be done. It has to be done either by the receiver or a new set of investors would come in or if government someday may add this thing. We, we are not there. We are not. Um, the important thing is that we need to finish off whatever it is started. At the start of the month, we took you to Keokuk, where we introduced you to Shelton Fuentes, the man who turned in American fugitive Aldrich Scott. Scott has since been returned to the U.S., where, after the discovery of his ex-girlfriend Carrie Allen's remains, his charges are expected to be upgraded. But back in Belize, it seems Shelton Fuentes isn't safe. On Christmas night, he told Seven News that he was attacked in Belize City by a man he believes to be Aldrich Scott's cousin. He has since asked for police protection. We communicated that request to ASP Fitzroy Yearwood yesterday, and here's what he had to say about Fuentes' situation. Shelton Fuentes, the man who turned in the alleged kidnapper, <coughs> Aldrich Scott, who was sent back to the U.S. Fuentes says he was attacked in Belize City on Saturday night, and he claims that one of Scott's cousins who we can only assume is a Belizean, is the man that attacked him. Any report as to such a matter? None reaching like this so far. But um, I'm certain or he will make a report in the future about it. I am hoping that it would be done today so that we can address it. Is there any protection that Belizean police would be able to offer Mr. Fuentes? Well, um, Based on the nature of his report, we will know what will take place. Um, I don't know who advised Mr. Fuentes to come forward to give a public interview when you um, allege that you turned in the fugitive. I mean, um, it was not advisable. It has already been done, and then we will have to see what we can do as a department to help him. Scott remains in jail on a $10 million bond. His public defenders are now asking a judge to unseal the search warrants and arrest affidavits in his case. And that's all we have for you for tonight. Thanks for watching with your news. I'm Indira Craig. Remember, you can find a full transcript of this newscast at 7newsbelize.com and see streaming video on our Facebook and YouTube pages. Do have a great night and join me back here tomorrow at 6.
my fellow Belizeans, I am honored to bring you greetings at this festive and symbolic time of the year. For Belizeans and the people the world over, crossing the bridge from one year to another is a passage that carries immense hope. Across our blessed land, reasons for hope are abundant. For the first time in a generation, our people and communities are infused with optimism. The worst of the COVID pandemic is behind us. More Belizeans than ever are working. The national economy is expanding at a record pace, and the nation is deepening its democracy and re-examining its constitution. As I have visited with Belizeans in villages, towns, and cities, and spent time on the ground in each district, it is clear to me that a renewed national pride enlivens homes, workplaces, and the public square. This positive energy will, I am sure, suffuse 2023 with spectacular rewards. A few days ago, for example, stakeholders in the all-important sugar sector bridged their differences so that we expect a bumper crop in both volume and price. To make this happen, my administration expanded our fuel and road repair subsidies, supported improving crop yields as a priority, and in a major first, will facilitate substantial fertilizer support to farmers, thanks to the government of Morocco. The positive breakthrough in the sugar industry is but one of many successes in a surging agricultural industry where the export of livestock and grains swell with each passing month, and where a nascent coconut subsector is poised for a boom in production, and where stakeholders are working to restore the luster of the citrus industry. Alongside agriculture, tourism, overnight and cruise tourism, the BPO sector, manufacturing and construction form the bedrock of the Belizean economic engine, robust and resilient in equal parts. Genuine entrepreneurs, investors small and large, and businesses of every stripe have and will continue to benefit from efficiencies and reforms that ratify this administration's high regard for the prosperity that only private enterprise can generate. The near miraculous economic rebound of the last two years has pushed down unemployment to historic lows, with poverty rates finally falling in tandem. And these important measures will continue to move in the right direction as we intensify our focus on policies and programs that unlock chances for upward mobility. I am particularly proud to highlight that 2023 will bring more money into the pockets of some 30,000 Belizean workers who are poised to enjoy a minimum wage of $5 per hour at the start of the new year. This $5 per hour is a 50% increase for one in every six of the lowest paid workers in our country. Earned by the employee's work, not gifted by the employer, the individual empowerment conferred by a living wage is a foremost responsibility of the state and the foundation of social justice. Adam Smith, known as the father of capitalism, reminded us in his theory of moral sentiments that the ethical basis of society lies in compassion for other human beings. Reversing the inequality gap of recent years is not just a societal interest, but a national imperative. And it is this commitment to compassion that compelled us to allocate earlier this month an additional $4 million for Carl Huchner Memorial Hospital to ensure tertiary health care is improved for those who can least afford private care. Furthermore, 2023 will span access to NHI program to 208,427 Belizeans. In the new year, 59,726 Belizeans will enroll for the first time in a program where doctors and medicines are quickly and affordably available. 
and in 2023, the accelerated rollout of starter homes, the awards of housing and farm life, and the extension of our free high school program will all represent a scaling up and scaling out of this administration's most impactful social justice priorities. In simple and straightforward terms, you should measure our success by keeping count of every new small business, every new job, every new homeowner, every new farmer, every new graduate, every Belizean better off than before we took office in the win we pledged to deliver. The year we leave behind, 2022, was a turbulent one. A devastating war in Ukraine, skyrocketing prices for fuel, costly supply chain disruptions, 40-year highs for inflation, and economic uncertainty all rendered a post-pandemic recovery more difficult for most countries. Judged within this upheaval, our country's performance is even more exceptional. At the start of 2021, my administration's first year, I encouraged small steps to stabilize the nation and reverse the alarming decline at the hands of the UDP. Those steps rescued the Belizean dollar, transformed the public finances, refocused investments in critical areas, and inspired confidence in the private sector, the IFIs, and foreign investors. At the start of this year, those steps became strides as the economy expanded. Thousands of new jobs emerged. Public sector employees had their salaries restored. Investments poured in, and Belize enjoyed global acclaim for the spectacular commitment to conservation and debt reduction. Our efforts at debt reduction has reduced the national debt by over $1 billion. Our debt to GDP ratio went from 133% under the UDP to 63%, a remarkable accomplishment to say the least. And now, in 2023, these steps and strides will become leaps forward as the twin propellants of tourism and agriculture elevate the quality of life yet higher, even as governance reforms cultivate greater inclusiveness, transparency, and national happiness. To every Belizean, I offer my gratitude for your contribution to the national welfare. We are a nation of limitless possibilities, a land where dreams spring forth from a soil rich and resilient, a country whose national fabric is woven from the timeless values of dignity, hard work, fairness, compassion, and mutual respect. And on behalf of our cabinet and the many men and women who are your government, I wish all Belizeans a happy new year. Long live Belize. Que viva Belize.